Raina Lynn Rison was born on May 6, 1976, in LaPorte, Indiana. She lived with her parents, Ben and Karen Rison. She had an older sister, Lori, and a younger sister, Wendy. In 1993, 16-year-old Raina was described as a good student and aspired to a career as a veterinarian because of her deep compassion for animals. Other than being a sophomore at LaPorte High School, Raina worked three jobs as well. She worked at the animal hospital where she walked dogs and cleaned kettles. On Friday, March 26, 1993, Raina was tasked with closing the animal hospital after a short shift from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Raina and her ex-boyfriend, Matt Elser, were planning to spend the evening together, and she could not wait to see him again. They had recently broken up, and the date was a step towards possibly getting back together. Like Raina, Matt came from a good, upstanding family and was regarded as a decent young man. In short, he was the kind of guy any parent would be happy to have their daughter date. Matt arrived at the animal hospital at 6 p.m. to pick up Raina. He got out of his car after waiting a while and headed to the front door, where he found that all of the lights were off and the door was closed. Matt saw that Raina's car was not in the parking lot, so he drove to her home to see if she was there. Raina's father, Ben, told Matt that she had not returned home from work. They hadn't seen her since she left home to go to the animal hospital for her shift. Her family assumed she was out on the date with Matt, but now they were worried. It was very unlike Raina to not tell her family where exactly she was. Raina's parents, her younger sister Wendy, and Matt all waited in the house for Raina to come home. When Raina had still not shown up by 10.30 p.m., her family went to the police station to report her as missing. The police could only register a missing person's report after waiting for 24 hours. Ben gave them a photo of Raina and asked them to be on the lookout either way since it was so unlike Raina. Her family then started to look for her. They tried to get in touch with her acquaintances, but no one knew where she could be. They also handed out missing persons flyers in the area, hoping someone would come forward with valuable information. When the police got involved, they made a public appeal for any information that led to Reyna's whereabouts. Immediately, a handful of eyewitnesses came forward, saying that just before 6 p.m., they saw a sedan parked outside the animal hospital where Raina worked. Multiple eyewitnesses said they saw two men in the sedan along with Raina. It appeared that Raina was arguing with the men. The witnesses ignored it at first since they assumed it was just a couple having an argument. Matt Elser was questioned by investigators. He stuck to his story about waiting for Raina and discovering that she was not at the animal hospital. The police learned that Matt had wanted to take a break from the relationship. They had taken a break, but recently gotten back together. Their date that night was supposed to be really special, and they were both looking forward to it. Matt knew something serious had to have happened for Raina to not show up. Raina's parents assured the authorities that Matt was a good and trustworthy young man. They also pointed out that his car was not the one witnesses saw clearing him of any wrongdoing. Raina's car was discovered the night after she disappeared, not far from the animal hospital. The car's hood was raised and gave the impression that she may have had car trouble. Officers were able to get her car started easily with her keys that were still in the ignition when they arrived. It appeared as if the car breakdown was staged. Furthermore, Officers saw that Raina's handbag was still in her car, which contained her purse and credit cards. All of her money was also still in the car, which meant this was definitely not a robbery. A man's ring was found in Raina's glove compartment. It was shown to Matt Elser. Matt said that it was not his ring. He identified the man's ring as belonging to Jason Tibbs. Jason was Raina's ex-boyfriend. They dated back in the seventh grade and broke up after being together for around eight months. 
He had a criminal history and had dropped out of school. Police decided to question 16-year-old Jason Tibbs. He admitted that the ring in question was really his and inquired as to where it had been found. When officers informed him it had been discovered in Reyna's car, he claimed that they were still friends and he had done some work on the car and must have forgotten his ring in the glove compartment. Jason said that he had taken off his ring to protect it from grime and grease while working on the car. Locals vouched for Jason and said that he was an excellent mechanic. It seemed plausible that Reyna had contacted him if she was having car trouble. Investigators asked him where he was on the night that she disappeared. Jason claimed that he had been playing a game of fox hunting. Fox hunting is a game of hide and seek, but played in cars. Friends share their locations over wireless radios and try to hunt each other down. His friends confirmed they'd been playing fox hunting that evening, but no one had actually seen Jason. Reyna's father confirmed that Reyna and Jason were friends, so the ring seemed to be a dead end. Reyna's case started to go cold until the police made a discovery. Matt's letterman jacket was found by a Laporte sheriff's deputy. Reyna had last been seen with the jacket. Matt gave it to Reyna to wear. It signified that the two of them were together. The jacket was found about six or seven miles away from where her car was found. The jacket had been placed there after the police's initial search. Unfortunately, the jacket yielded no further clues or evidence. On April 26, 1993, a month after Raina was last seen, a fisherman and his teenage daughter were at a pond off Range Road, north of Laporte, Indiana. The daughter was taking a stroll when she saw a pair of human legs in the water. She yelled for her father to come take a look. He went closer and determined that it was a female body in the water. Two logs were placed on top of her body. When police arrived at the scene, they noted that the unknown woman wore the same clothes that Reyna was last seen wearing before she disappeared. Despite the body's advanced state of decomposition, it was determined that she was Raina Rison. This was no longer a missing persons case. No obvious wounds or signs of significant trauma were found on her body. Later, during the autopsy, it was concluded that Raina had been strangled. With the discovery, investigators went back to Jason Tibbs to see if he knew anything. He told them about Ray McCarty, Ray was married to Raina's older sister, Lori Rison. Ray had assaulted and impregnated Raina when she was 11 and had been imprisoned for the crime. His probation ended only two months before Raina went missing. You'd think Lori Rison would have divorced Ray for what he did, but no, they were still married. He clearly had a motive and was dangerous with a past criminal record targeted against Raina. Investigators visited Ray and Lori's house. The couple told investigators that neither of them saw Raina on the day she disappeared. Ray stated that he was busy shooting pigeons on a friend's farm that night. The detectives called the friend and he confirmed that Ray was indeed with him that night. Something didn't feel right to investigators, so they went to talk with Ray again. Ray talked to them alone and told them that he had seen Raina on the night she vanished. He told them that he was house hunting on March 26, 1993. At about 5.40 p.m., he was gazing out the window of a house when he saw the animal hospital. He claimed he had just briefly seen Raina at the parking lot of the animal hospital and asked if she knew where Lori was. He then left and picked up a female hitchhiker that night. Ray claimed the hitchhiker was the reason why he initially did not want to admit to having seen her. She did not fully trust him after what he did to her sister. Ray McCarty became the main suspect at this point, but there was no physical evidence connecting him to the crime, and the case went cold. Unfortunately, the case remained cold for almost 18 months. It was then that Indiana State Police pulled over a van driven by Larry Hall. Hall would travel across the Midwest for Civil War and the Independence War reenactments. 
His van resembled one used in an attempted kidnapping. The police examined the van and discovered several items related to Reyna's case. In his van, he had newspaper clippings of Reyna and a prescription bottle with the name R. Ryson on it. Larry claimed he was the one that abducted and slayed Reyna. He was then arrested. Detectives investigated his movements on the night of her disappearance and discovered that he was in Kentucky and the prescription bottle was a fake. Hall had falsely confessed to abducting and slaying around 50 other women. He seemed like the type of person who would insert himself into any investigation and confess. Larry Hall was subsequently ruled out as a suspect in Raina's case. He was not completely innocent, though. He was found guilty of taking 15-year-old Jessica Roach's life. I'll go over the case briefly at the end of the video for those interested. As for Raina's case, it remained cold until 1998. Investigators did not know what else they could do and looked at their initial suspects again. Matt Elser, Jason Tibbs, and Ray McCarty. Matt's alibi was solid, and investigators never really considered him a serious suspect. Jason's story of fox hunting wasn't that solid because no one actually saw him, but it seemed he was on good terms with Reyna. Ray, on the other hand, lied about his alibi at first, and he was most definitely a horrible person, so investigators decided to focus on him. They got a warrant to search Ray's property. Inside his house, investigators found two handguns and a stun gun. They also discovered blood in his car's trunk, but were unable to determine its source. Ray McCarty was arrested in May 1998. He waited in jail for 15 months while the police continued to build their case against him. While Ray was in jail, a new prosecutor had been assigned. He was a hunter, and it was concluded that the blood belonged to a deer. The prosecutor felt that there was not enough evidence linking him to the crime, and they were forced to let him go again. He was released after a year in jail. For the next nine years, the case would once again be classified as a cold case, unfortunately. Then, in 2008, police got a lead that would blow this case wide open. They received a letter from an inmate serving a 44-year sentence. His name is Ricky Hammonds. He requested to talk with investigators. Ricky was in prison because he took his roommate's life. Ricky said he decided to come forward after thinking about his niece. He said he would want someone to come forward if anything had happened to her. This is everything he had to say. Back in 1993, when he was 14 years old, he was in the roof of a barn next to his parents' house smoking marijuana. He heard a car drive in the barn. Ricky saw his sister's boyfriend, Eric Feldman, and Jason Tibbs. They opened the trunk of his sister's sedan, and Ricky then saw a body covered by a blanket. Ricky could still make out the upper half of the victim. It was a female wearing a Leatherman jacket. He did not know it was Reyna, but a couple of days later, when Reyna's face appeared in the media, he realized who it was. Ricky said that he was scared to come forward back in 1993 because he was worried he would get into trouble for smoking marijuana. The police tracked Eric Fieldman down in South Carolina. He was visibly nervous. He did not want to speak to them and refused all interviews. Investigators then told him he will face no consequences if he can tell them exactly what happened with Reyna. He accepted the deal and told them everything. Eric said that he and Jason were cruising in his girlfriend's sedan when they drove past the animal hospital on March 26, 1993. Jason wanted to get Reyna to leave Matt and take him back. When she exited the animal hospital, he called her over to the car. She clearly did not want to talk to him. Before she could scream, he pushed her into the car and told Eric to drive away quickly. A couple minutes later, Eric stopped the car and Reyna tried to run away. Jason followed her and said, If I can't have you, no one can. He then strangled her until she stopped breathing. 
Jason and Eric loaded Raina's body in the trunk and drove to the barn. That is where Ricky saw them. After much deliberation, Eric and Jason then decided to place Raina's body in the pond and weigh her down with logs. Eric drove Jason back to the clinic to pick up Raina's car. Jason abandoned the car. He also discarded Matt's jacket. In August 2013, 38-year-old Jason Tibbs was arrested and charged with taking Raina Rison's life. 20 years had passed since Raina's life was ended. His trial started in late 2013. His defense argued that Ricky was not a trustworthy witness since he was a high school student at the time and because he waited 15 years to come forward with the truth. In order to ensure that Eric Freeman testified truthfully in the trial, he was granted immunity from prosecution. After a lengthy trial that lasted until December 2014, Jason Tibbs was found guilty. He was sentenced to 40 years in prison with 20 years served. Outside the courtroom, Raina's family cried. They hugged each other and the prosecutor. The Rison family got some form of justice, but the daughter they'd lost in a crime of passion would never come back. Tibbs still claims that he is innocent and that Ray McCarty is responsible for what happened to Raina. Tibbs made numerous appeals to the Indiana Supreme Court after being shot down by the state's appellate court. On September 8, 2016, the Indiana Court of Appeals ruled against a request for a new trial by Jason Tibbs. As recently as 2018, his lawyers publicly stated that they are still fighting for his innocence. Raina was 16 years old and had her whole life ahead of her. She was finally happy again when she and Matt got back together. Unfortunately, it seems that she was surrounded by terrible people that let her down. As promised, I'll go over some of the details of Jessica Roach's case. 15-year-old Jessica lived in Georgetown, Illinois in 1993. She had dreams of one day being a pilot. On September 20th, 1993, Jessica Roach went outside to ride her new bicycle. Tragedy struck when Jessica's sister found the bike lying on the road, but Jessica was nowhere to be found. Her sister alerted their father, who contacted the police, but Jessica would never be seen alive again. Six weeks after she went missing, her remains were discovered in Perrysville, Indiana, which is close to the state's border. Her body was found by a farmer who made the discovery while using his combine. Jessica's body showed signs of having been there for some time. Due to the state of her remains, it was difficult for investigators to learn more about when, how, or where she lost her life. Police found suspect Larry Hall about a year later when he began trailing a pair of girls. The girls reported him to the police and provided investigators with Hall's license plate number. When he was brought in for police questioning and shown a photo of Jessica, Hall apparently flinched and covered his face before denying that he'd ever seen her. A confession eventually did trickle out, with Hall telling police that he tied her up but couldn't remember what he used. He then said that he removed her clothing, assaulted her, and strangled her against a tree with his belt. Hall also provided vague descriptions of other young girls he'd abused. I picked up several girls in other areas, but I can't remember which ones I hurt, he told police. Investigators determined that he was falsely confessing to a lot of crimes, but that he did indeed take Jessica's life. Hall was given a life sentence with no possibility of parole. He is currently incarcerated at a medium security prison in North Carolina. Jessica Roach's loved ones held benefits in past years in her memory, and in 2015, they created a scholarship in her name.